All right, uh, Nancy Weddle, our member here. She's worked on workshops. She's been a member for since the beginning. And uh, she is going to introduce our speaker. Thank Hi, you everyone. Much. I'm so glad that you're here. I am pleased to introduce Mike Davis. He is a retired professor and cooperative extension specialist in the Department of Plant Pathology at UC Davis, where he taught, where he taught plant pathology classes as well as courses on mushroom identification and cultivation. Most of his research was focused on environmentally sound management of fungal diseases of field crops and vegetables including mushrooms. His written <clears throat> popular articles and technical papers on mushrooms, including descriptions of several new species. He is the lead author of The Field Guide to Mushrooms of Western North America, published in 2012. And welcome. So it's a, it's a big industry, 
the, the largest mushroom producing state is Pennsylvania and then California. All right, so maybe you're familiar with this one. This one, it, it grows around here. It grows in the Sierra Nevada. It grows in the coastal for, forests. It, the, the typical mushroom season is the fall. The fall, okay, the Sierra, because we're in the Sierra Nevada. The Sierra's a little bit tricky. If we get rain in the Sierra before it turns cold, we'll get a lot of mushrooms. But sometimes the Sierra goes from dry to cold and snowy. So it's, it's a little hit or miss in the Sierra. But sometimes it can be very good. You remember the remnants of Hur Hurricane Hillary, I don't know, six weeks ago or something like that? And it rained in the high Sierras. And there was a good fruiting of mushrooms in the high Sierras. I don't know about this elevation, but, but that brought up a lot of good mushrooms. So we generally look for mushrooms in the fall, when it cools, when it turns, when the temperature drops, when the humidity rises and we get rain. If that happens, about three weeks after a good soaking rain, mushrooms will come up. There's also a, another certain bunch of mushrooms that grow in the spring, and only in the spring. And I'll point that out. This one is pretty common in the Sierra if, if you get a good rain. It's called a flying gear because if you take a little piece of tissue here, mash it up in a saucer of milk, and let houseflies lick it up, they immediately act like they're drunk and will fly in loops and circles and crash into the wall. It's quite fun. <laughs> I don't think it's animal. I don't think it's animal abuse because they do recover, and I don't know if, it's, if they get drunk because this mushroom is hallucinogenic. So people do use it recreational because it's hallucinogenic, but it will also make you sick. They don't quite sick. So you have to really want to go on a trip or something to eat that mushroom. It's called it, yeah, it's called a fly bear because of the fly, and some people associate it with Christmas because it's red and white, got fluffy decorations like Santa Claus. But, but okay, and I'll stop that myth right now because it was actually Coca-Cola that dressed up St. Nicholas, the patron saint of children, in their colors. So Santa Claus has nothing to do with this mushroom. Although you hear about it, you read about it all the time. But you do, some people, wake up early in the morning and look for presents under a conifer, right? And that's where this one grows. So there's that possible connection, and I'm not sure about that one either, but reindeer, caribou, reindeer surely like to eat this one, and it's hallucinogenic, and reindeer fly at Christmas. <laughs> So that's the only one I buy into. <laughs> anyway, the fly bear is, is maybe one of, it's probably the most famous mushroom, photogenic, artistic mushroom in the world. Okay, so what are mushrooms? So they're analogous to the apple on an apple tree. The apple carries the seeds, the reproductive units. A seed is a special thing of a plant because, as you know, there's a small plant, an embryo, inside the seed. And fungi are different, but the, but the apple itself is analogous to the fruiting body. The fruiting body, we don't call it the fruit, we call it the fruiting body. So this is where the reproductive units, in this case, spores, are born. Okay. And where are they born? If you, you need a microscope, but they're born on the faces, on the faces and the edge of the gills. So these are these are four spores on a special cell called the basidium there. But all these are these are called gills, these plates. Like this is a plate here. It increases the surface area 
tremendously of that mushroom. So if this mushroom just would have a flat surface, it would have X number of spores, but with these, all these plates, it now has a surface area a thousand times that much. Okay, so those are spores of a typical mushroom. You're familiar with that, the cap and the stalk. Okay, and then there's another group, those are called the simiomyces, you don't have to worry about that term. Another, another group called ascomyces that essentially are cups. And uh, in this case, the spores are born in sacs, in sacs called acai, that line the surface of the cup. Some of you are familiar with morels that, you, that grow in the spring. I said there's some mushrooms that only grow in spring morels with spring, fruity mushroom. So if you think of a morel as a series of cups on a stalk. So a morel, and I'll show you a picture of morels later if, you, if you're not familiar with, but a morel is a series of these cups on a stalk. So a morel is an ascomycete. One of the differences, um, an interesting difference between the two, other than this primary difference, is when a mushroom like this, of the seedmycete, is young, it pops up overnight. You all kind of noticed that before in the forest or in your lawn. It just seemed to pop up overnight. And that's because when this mushroom was just a tiny little knot of threads, all the cells were present to make that mushroom. All it did was take up water, was in my water. So every cell took up water, and that's why it grew up overnight. This group, that includes the morales, grows one layer of cells at a time, so it's slow growing. But the basidiomyces pop, pop up overnight, seemingly. Okay, so how do we identify mushrooms? And let me say now, if you want to distinguish between a poisonous and edible mushroom, you have to know every mushroom. There's no easy test that you can use. You can't cook it with a silver spoon. <laughs> you can't use the rule that if it grows on wood, it's edible. You'll really get in trouble if you do that. So there's, there's no easy way. You have to be able to identify the mushrooms. So you can go to a book or you can ask somebody to help you. And usually if you're interested in, in collecting mushrooms to eat, you would learn one mushroom really well and only target that one mushroom. You would even learn mushrooms that look like that one. So you make absolutely no mistake. And then the next time you go out, maybe you learn another one. Now you're targeting two mushrooms. So that's how you have to do it. Okay, so this is what we use. It, we might use the cap stopping color, maybe. The spore color is really important. Any book that you're going to use, first of all, I'm going to ask you the color of the spore. And I'll show you how you do that. And I'll talk about the veil arrangement, how the gills are attached to the stalk, the habitat where it grows. And then today, if you're going to describe a mushroom, you would need some mic microscopic characteristics. And then for sure today, you would use DNA sequences. You know, Nancy said I named some mushrooms, and I haven't, that's no big deal. So our mushrooms, the names that we use for our mushrooms, in, let's say in California, we borrow them either from the East Coast or from Europe because they're related, they're, they look alike, but people have known that they're not quite the same. So with DNA technology, and it's very easy to get DNA sequences, I won't describe it, but if you give me a mushroom, well, I'm retired now, but if you gave me a mushroom, I could get, I could extract the DNA, you know, within an hour. That's no problem. And then I could get the sequences overnight. And so it would be that fast. And then I would plug in the sequences to a large database and to compare what's out there. I mean, it's, it's that simple. It's no big deal. Anyway, so our mushrooms in California, while they may have names, they're technically not right. At least a lot of them. It's changing. People are naming new mushrooms all the time. But most of the mushrooms in California need new names. So to give a mushroom a name these days isn't that big of a deal. Okay, parts of a mushroom. So now you know the gills 
right? This is where the spores are born. The whole purpose of the cap here is to protect the spores, which are on the gills. So that when they mature, when the spores mature, they're ejected down and they're really light, and the, and the wind, the air, any air current carries them away. So there are mushroom spores by the millions in this room right now. They're, they're very light and, you know, they're much bigger than a seed of a plant. Okay, this one, this mushroom has a stalk. This mushroom has a ring. And this mushroom has a cup at the base. Not all mushrooms have a ring, not all mushrooms have a cup. And let me explain what that is. So the ring is the remnants of a tissue called a veil that used to connect to the edge of the cap. So this tattered end of the ring used to connect to the margin of the cap. When the cap grew, it broke, leaving a ring on the stalk. Also, some mushrooms have tissue that surrounds the whole mushroom when it was young. When it was young. When the mushroom expanded, as we know, they expand quickly. That tissue that surrounded the whole mushroom broke, leaving maybe a patch on the cap or warts, like that fly anemone had white warts on the cap. That was the that those were the remnants of the universal <coughs> veil. This is called the universal veil. It also leaves a cup at the base when it expands, right? That's really important, extremely important. The, the group that contains the deadly mushrooms, okay, there are deadly mushrooms everywhere, but uh, the group that contains many of the deadly mushrooms has this cup. That's why you have to know. If you, I know you're not going to go out there and just collect mushrooms willy-nilly, really but if you did, are thinking about collecting mushrooms, you have to be able to know what this feature is and to identify it in the field. Okay, that's called a cup or a bowl. And then the bigger part of the mushroom is made up of filaments, threads, called mycelium or hyphae. So this is the bulk of the fungus. And I just drew this little picture here, but if this was in the ground, the mycelium would be out of this building, and that side of the building, and way out in the parking lot, way out into the forest. Very extensive. And some of these, the, the mycelium, connect to the roots of trees and other plants in and around the roots of trees and bushes and other plants. And these hyphae threads function like roots of a tree. So the tree has many more roots, if you include these, than what you're familiar with. Thousands of times more exploratory fine roots into the soil. You've seen pine trees growing in cracks of granite. Just seems impossible. They they couldn't grow there if it wasn't for the fungus. It, so it's a mutually beneficial association. The tree gets nutrients from the fungus, and the fungus gets sugars from the plant. It produces by photosynthesis. So the fungus provides nutrients like nitrogen, but especially phosphorus. You gardeners know that phosphorus does not move in soil. The plant has to grow to the phosphorus. The phosphorus doesn't move. So you can imagine then that if you have all these hyphae exploring the soil, you're going to be able to pick up more phosphorus. That makes sense? Okay, so this, this uh, and we won't worry about the 
scientific names. This mushroom, it does not have a ring. Doesn't have a ring. Many don't. Probably most don't. Does it have a cup? Yes. Yes, it has a cup. Okay, or a bowl. Okay. So this one is the same as this one, but you can't see the bowl, the cup of the base. So this is really important. If you're collecting mushrooms, you have to get down there with a knife or something and dig it up and make sure it doesn't have a bowl. All right? Yes. Back in the back first. Yeah. Getting back to the hind thing. Uh huh. Do those exist without? I'm going to incorrectly probably call the bloom. So do do the mushroom. Yes, they exist. They, you, they exist uh, all the time, and, and this, the fruiting body, only exists sometimes. So, yeah, so they're on the ground. They're, and let me expand. The ones that produce mushrooms like this in the forest, many of those, it's, it's this mycorrhizal association, it's called. So they are connected with the tree roots. And almost every plant and anywhere has has hyphae associated with their roots. Your grass, your flowers, your bushes. The only thing is many don't produce fruity bodies like this. They produce microscopic spores, so you never see it. But it's a it's a, a beneficial association between the plant and the fungus, but many of them, and the, most of the plants in your yard, for example, don't produce mushrooms, but they produce microscopic spores. And the fungus is helping the plant grow. And so then you have this mycelium that is spread over yeah. a wide area. Yeah. Will it have fruiting bodies off of the same yes. mycelium? Yes. Yeah. The same colony, yep. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I'm going to repeat that. And um, so, the, yeah, the question is does this colony of mycelium? One individual have mushrooms scattered around, and the answer is yes. And it can be very large, especially with some. There's a, there's one fungus maybe you've heard about this. There's one fungus in Oregon. It's called a honey mushroom. It's over like like square miles. One individual over square miles, and people have estimated its weight by the bundles of hyphae, it, it would weigh way more than a blue whale. So people think that that particular fungus is the largest, among the largest organisms on the planet. There are people who study aspens who would argue with that. But they're not here. <laughs> so the answer is yes, the colony can be huge. And there are all different kinds of yes. Yeah, this, this one that is so huge is a, is a special one that's able to do that. Most of them aren't that big. But big. Yes. Is, it, is it possible for the mycelium, besides providing nutrition, uh, act as a, a telegraph so, and provide, convey information? Yeah, so can the mycelium connect to this tree over here and connect to this tree over here and can nutrients flow back and forth? Or some kind of signal answer is yes. That's a big area of study right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it was Nova had a program on that on TV. Yes, the answer is yes. I have a question. In my garden, I've been reading you aren't supposed to tell up the soils and stuff. If I do tell up the soils, yeah. is that going to destroy or disrupt that my seeding growth? Yeah. Yes, it will. Question? The, if you till the soil, does it disrupt the mycelium? It does. You're, you're not going to till deep enough, of course, to, you know, to bother. So, yeah, you won't till deep enough that you're going to eliminate it. Um, How deep do they go? Very. <laughs> Wherever the roots are, they deep, many feet deep. Uh, and you're, you know, you're not going to till only six inches. Or, you think you are, but you're not. <laughs> uh, yeah. And of course, another reason not to till if you can, because you're exposing everything to the air, and everything's oxidizing, and you're 
you're destroying a lot of things. Yeah. But I mean, sometimes you have to, but I'm not arguing. <laughs> Yes. How fast do they reproduce? So one of the, uh, this, it, it, yeah. well, it, it depends on. Like on, how many mushrooms? I mean, how, how quickly did they get that big? How could they replace themselves? Oh, if it covers the forest, that would be decades and decades. Oh, yeah, yeah. decades and decades, many decades. Uh, so yeah, one, if one spore lands in a favorable spot, uh, it won't grow very far in a year. Yeah. Another question? Um, does the type of soil, like the clay soil here, yeah. you know, make it difficult for the mycelium to make its way through your know, different distributions of the soil? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Does the soil type make a difference? And yes, heavy, heavy clay, yes, limits the ability of the mycelium to explore the soil. You know, in a forest, the mycelium is is not that deep. It may be under the duff layer. Yeah. So, you know, if you if you want to find truffles, for example, a truffle is a fruiting body of a particular fungus that's underground. Instead of above ground, it's underground. And all you have to do is move that duff layer. You know, in a forest, there should be duff layer. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So. Does that have another name? I'm, what I'm looking for is it's somewhat similar to a death cap. That is related to the death cap. It's not the death cap. Okay. It's, it's not the death cap. Okay. But I'll, I'll show you the death cap. Oh, so this one, you see the universal bell tissue, right? So this tissue is surrounded by mushroom, and it's going to expand, and this is going to leave that cup of hole. That's, that's why I wanted to stress that. Yeah, we're all on the same page. Okay, back to identifying mushrooms. So we're going to get the spore color. The spores are microscopic, so you can't tell their color by looking at one spore, even under the microscope. So you have to collect them in mass. So this is what you do. You take a mushroom and you cut off the cap. You, you just cut off the cap and put it on a piece of paper. Here's on my paper. So this cap was here, and it dropped the spores maybe four hours, but better overnight. And the spores, uh, the cap was covered by a bowl, so the air currents in the room didn't carry away the spores. So they all dropped down on the piece of paper. And now, in MASH, you can tell that this particular mushroom has a brown spore color. So any book that you use, the first thing, it's going to ask you what, what color the spores. So now you know how to do that. And you can make art here. That some are reddish, <laughs> some are yellow, some are white. Um, there's one green spore mushroom. Um, yeah, purple. So you can do, make art out of that. And then the book is going to ask you how the gills are attached to the stalk, if it has a stalk. And so maybe it doesn't touch the stalk, and that's called free. And there's different names. If it's, if it's broad, if the gills are broadly attached, it's called adnate. If they're just barely attached, it's called adnex. Don't, don't worry about these names. They may be notched or they may run down the stalk. It's called the current. So look at this mushroom. How, how are the gills attached? Great. Great. Okay, so now we have a spore color, brown. You know the gills are free. And then the book is going to ask you, does it have a ring? Yes. And then you, you, you can't see it on this picture, the, but the book is going to say, does it have a vulva? Does it have a cup at the base? And you're going to say no. You can't see it here, but you'll say no. And you are really going to get close. You're going to get, in this case, you're going to get to a garage. You're going to get to the genus. From there, it's, it's a little hard, but that's enough. We'll move on. Okay, so how do these mushrooms, these fungi, make a living? So they may be saprobic, or also called saprophytic, if, you, if you're just talking about something that lives on dead plants. But if you're, if you're talking about something that lives on a dead organism, it's saprobic. And so you've seen this in the mountains, uh, a tree stump. Um, this one is up high, it's the red. Red fir. 
Thank you, Renfer. So it's the uh, fungi are responsible for breaking down wood, for decomposing wood. I mean, bacteria contribute, but it's fungi that do the lion's job. Okay, so if this fungus that's breaking down the wood here removed all the cellulose. It left a lot of lignin. That's why this is decomposing into little cubes because the, some of the lignin is still intact. So this has broken down the lignin and I mean the cellulose and left the lignin. Sometimes you see a tree that's rotting, but it's white inside. That's because you have it's called brown water, a fungus that broke down the lignin but left the cellulose. So you can tell the difference there. Okay, some are pathogenic, meaning they cause diseases. This one, if it shows up for you, um, is growing at the base of this oak tree. This is on UC Davis campus. And it was a good one to take the students to because it would fruit every year and it was killing this tree and ultimately it did kill the tree. And the grounds people just put another one back. So. <laughs> that was fine with me. Good for my class. <laughs> this happens to be the honey mushroom. This is that same species I talked about in Oregon. That's the biggest organism in the world. Yeah? Okay, this happens to be the same one. And then we're talking about the, the beneficial ones. They're called mycorrhizal. Myco is fungus, rhizal is root. So these are the ones that grow in and around the roots of plants. So if you look at these photos here, if you can see this, let's look at this one down here. There's a brown root here. I don't know if you can see that. This was some kind of tree that was in the forest. But the roots are surrounded by something white, and that's the fungal tissue. If you go, after we get a rain and the, and the fungi really start growing, dig down just under the duff layer, and you'll, you'll find this yourself and you'll and you'll wonder what that is and that is the fungus growing around the roots. Now it was always there but it's starting to grow in, in, a, in a big heavy mass now so it's really visible. And this root system is covered with a fungus that's kind of orange in color and this one's also an orange brown color. So this these are the root systems of the tree but surrounded by the fungus. That's why when you go out to a forest and you find lots of mushrooms, that's why a forest is so generous to a mushroom hunter. Because a lot of those mushrooms are mycorrhizal with the pine trees, the spruce trees, the oak trees, and so forth. Question? Yes? So I have a question about the, the ones that are growing around the roots. Is that beneficial or disastrous for the root? No, 100% no, beneficial. It's beneficial. They evolve together. They, you know, there, there's a, a close symbiotic relationship between the plant and the fungus. Yeah. Well, you know, if you want to take it way back, I can't remember. I can't remember my dates. 450 million years ago. I can't remember the dates. When plants invaded land, they probably couldn't have done it without fungi. Yeah. Another question. Yes. There are three different colors there. Yeah. What is the species? Yeah, each is a different kind, a different species of fungus. That's right. Yeah. Because I've seen the white and Yeah, a different, different, I don't know which one, but they're, they're all different. Right. Yeah. They even, if, if you want to get technical, even change the, the shape of the root system. It's hard to see, but you wouldn't find a pine root that looks like that unless it was infected with a beneficial fungus. Okay. Okay. What is this? A fairy ring. Yeah, a fairy ring, right? And and here's one, and here's one, and here, you know, incomplete ones and so forth. And so what are they? So a spore landed in the center here and then grew out in all directions. Maybe within a year, you know, that size, okay, throughout all directions. And when the conditions were right, the, when the conditions were right, they, it fruited, it 
it fruited. There, these, these are the fruiting bodies, the mushrooms. It takes a lot of humidity. Even though mushrooms are pretty big, you hold them in your hand, we still consider them microorganisms because the hyphae, those threads, are very tiny, microscopic, and they have a tremendous surface area relative to their volume. So they're very susceptible to drying out. Right? That's why we see mushrooms when it's wet. Right. Okay, so the conditions are right and, and, and form this fairy ring. So why is the fairy ring gr darker green? Nutrients from what? Nitrogen. Yeah, okay, in this case, the fungus is breaking down the thatch. It's breaking down the old stems, the old leaves, and that kind of thing. And when it breaks down those things, it releases nitrogen and phosphorus and so forth. And that's why the grass is happy. The fungus is happy and the grass is happy. And sometimes, maybe you have experience with fairy rings, inside it doesn't grow very well. And the reason it may surprise you, and that's because the mycelium, the threads, are so thick and heavy in here, water doesn't penetrate. It kind of runs off. That's why it doesn't do well. So put on your high heel shoes and walk around. <laughs> this is a golf course in, uh, outside of Olympia, Washington. My wife and I took a long weekend. In the fall, when it was raining up there, we drove up to, uh, we flew to, no, we flew to the SeaTac, the airport there, rented a car, and drove out on the Olympic Peninsula. It was wet and it's cold, and kind of cold, and people aren't golfing. Well, there's a cardboard box or some kind of box, leave money, go golf, it said, but nobody was golfing. So we just walked around this golf course, and it was full of the psychedelic mushrooms. So I'm giving you a hint here. <laughs> the, the, these aren't them, but they were common. So there you go. If you ever want to find any, you know exactly where to go. Oh, yes. She wants a GPS cord. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Head west. Uh, um, what causes the structure of the paragraph to be reshaped? Oh, yeah. Out? Because, yeah, because the spore. Uh, some time ago, the spore landed in the middle, and it, it germinates by sending out hyphae, the threads, yeah. and they go in all directions. So there's a colony. But sometimes you don't see that in, like, as extravagant as that. No, no, like, this is an arc. Okay. It's the same kind of thing, but it, it, it wasn't, this one was, didn't successfully, you know, colonize out here for some reason. Okay. Yeah. And that's more common in an area. Yeah. You, you, do you, yeah, do you see them all? Can you see them from your angle? I don't know if you can. There are arcs all over the place. Yeah. But this was a nice rain, so of course. Yeah. Okay. That's the one I can change. Yeah. Oh, so that that giant honey mushroom again, back to the organ thing. So this that one's a pathogen, like killing that tree on the campus. Do you see all the dead trees? Uh -huh. Okay. Also, this particular mushroom has bundles of these mycelium. Bundles. They're, they look like, these, this is a fungus, not the roots of a tree. They look like a root or a shoestring or something. And that's why you can go out to this forest and estimate the size, the weight of that mushroom, right? So this, this, is a, this is a clump of mushrooms I found in Davis. This one grows on oak trees. And if you take out your oak tree, or it dies or something. You know, you're leaving some of the big scaffold roots, at least some of the big roots in the ground, right? And they're going to be infected. And so you come and plant the cherry tree in that spot. It's going to grow from those oak root pieces and onto your cherry tree. Right? That's a it's a big deal in California. Yeah, kill the tree. Yeah, it'll kill the tree. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to just go through a bunch of mushrooms, and these are the real colors. I didn't doctor anything. No Photoshop here. Um, this slide, I just want to show you uh, the variety of colors. And so, if you haven't gone mushroom hunting, um, you know, I encourage you to do so. 
Fungi are one of the big kingdoms of life on the planet, right? There's animals and plants and fungi and bacteria, archaea, bacterial life. We won't get into that, but uh, but you know, fungi are, are huge. There are many, many more species of fungi than there are plants. Also, if you and again, if you want to get technical about it, fungi are more closely related to animals than they are to plants. Yeah. Anyway, um, lots of beautiful colors. This one's called the orange peel mushroom for obvious reasons. Where is that? From? The, sorry. Where is that? From? This. Where did I take these? So, my place where I usually go and I take take the students took the students was the coastal forest. Point Reyes, you know, all the time go there. Um, Jackson State Forest. Yes, but oh, right. south of there, you know, the park. Oh. Uh, the character? No, south. Joe. Oh. Holy cow! Will Reckon Gulls. It's a state park. It's north of Adelia Bay, north of Jenner. What's the matter with me? You're oh, right. South Salt Springs. Point. Salt Point, thank you very much. Salt Point State Park. Salt Point State Park is open for mushroom hunting. You can't uh, hunt in um, national parks generally. You can in national forests. You're supposed to go to the ranger and get a permit. They'll just give it to you. State forests, you can get a permit. Not commercial hunting. Point Reyes, they, I forget, it's five pounds plus one mushroom or something like that. Um, salt Point's open. So, you know, you go to or private land, but you go to certain places. And so I spent so many days on the coast. To answer your question, on the coast. In the coastal forest. Okay, um, what, yes, yes. Well, are you encouraged if you're out looking for mushrooms yep. to wear like latex gloves and a mask yeah. or something? No. About the spores? Is it yeah. Okay to... Yeah, you, you wouldn't get enough spores, so I'm not worried about that. Unless, unless you, you know, have allergies to fungi, to molds, you know. If, you, if you're collecting mushrooms, there are a lot of mold spores in the air because it's damp. And, so there's that anyway. But yeah, I'm going to worry. And then uh, about touching uh, poisonous mushrooms. Yeah. No, I, I don't worry about it. I mean, don't put your hands in your mouth. But I don't worry about it. Yeah. I mean, spores are poisonous. I'm not, yeah. They, so, if you did a spore print, you wouldn't want to eat the spores, for example. So they, they are poisonous. Okay. When we collect mushrooms, we also want to smell them. A lot of them have interesting odors, and some of those odors are used for identification. This mushroom, this tricholoma, it's called, it, it grows in the Sierra. Okay, a lot of mushrooms grow in the Sierra after the snow melt. So, the snow melts at the lower elevation, melts its way up to the top. So you go follow the snow melt. Soon after the snow melt, a bunch of mushrooms comes out. This, this one, it smells like cucumber. This one smelled in the coastal forest smells just exactly like licorice. Oh. Yes. The chanterelles, some of you are familiar with chanterelles. Yeah. Uh, while we're at, this, at the chanterelle, notice the gills, how they run down the stalks in the chanterelle. Mm -hmm. So once you know chanterelles, you know, you, you're good to go for chanterelles. A fresh chanterelle smells like apricots. And then there's a mushroom, a small mushroom that smells like garlic. It will, the whole forest will smell like garlic even before you see the mushrooms. <laughs> it's one of my favorite ones, just for that reason. It's a nice one. Is there, uh, oh, yes? Is there a health risk to smelling mushrooms? Uh, you, you wouldn't get enough spores. You know, I bet there's toxic mushroom spores in the air right now. And so, you know, it gets to that point where it, such a small amount doesn't matter. Okay. I'm not sure. But it's a good question. It's a good question. These are uh, mushrooms I found in lawns. Actually, uh, just happened to be in this crowd. Years ago, it happened to be in Georgetown at a friend's house, and he had a bunch of mushrooms growing in his lawn. Um, you, you've probably seen this one. It's called a dunce cap. Yep. It comes and goes quickly. Um, this one grows in lawns. Um, 
Yeah, it's kind of hard to identify, but you don't want to eat that one. This one's interesting because it makes you sweat. Yeah. Salivate and sweat. That's no fun. This one happens to be edible, but I, yeah, forget it. Okay, and then, I'm sorry, one of you came up to me before I started talking. This white one is growing right now. It's one of the earliest ones in the fall. It, it doesn't, it grows in lawns, but it, it'll grow in wood chips and areas like that. Um, it's a saprophyte, so it's breaking down the wood chips or the thatch in the lawn. It is white, it, it has free gills, it has a ring, and all those characteristics are character, characteristics of some deadly mushrooms. But it doesn't have the cup, it does not have a cup. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't eat it, right? Because you could make a mistake. So I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that this is common right now. Look for it. It looks like some of the deadly mushrooms, but there is no cup at the base. It's swollen, but there's no cup. It's called a white parasol, or sometimes people call it woman on motorcycle. <laughs> there, there's also a man on the side. Yes. I live close by, and I know that when when a mushroom comes up, sometimes night creatures will come and eat it. Yeah. What animals? Well, slugs and rats and deer and rabbits. Oh, they shouldn't. They shouldn't eat the deadly ones, though. But they know the difference. I don't, nobody knows how. I don't find a dead critters. Yeah, it, that, yeah that's kind of amazing thing. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully they eat those alone. <laughs> this, these are agaricus relating to the common button mushroom in the grocery store. Uh, you'll find those right now. This is called a field mushroom. A lot of people like to pick this one. Um, it, it has a ring, but it's hardly a ring. It's, it's very hard to see. Just a, a wispy ring. One way to identify this mushroom with brown spores is the margin of the cap just slightly overlaps the gills. Can you see that? That's unusual. So that's that's called the, the metal mushroom. People like that one. And this one is very common. It, they look this, similar. This one, if you rub it, it turns yellow. Do you see that? I rubbed it with my tongue. Or I could have broken it. Um, it's very common. It's common right now. It's not good to eat. It, it makes you sick to your stomach. <laughs> anyway, if you have to see something that looks like that, rub it. You'll be surprised. <laughs> it's like magic. There's something in there's something in it that oxidizes. You know, it exposes the oxygen in the air. Inky caps. I think a lot of you anyway are familiar with this one called the shaggy mane. Yeah, you've seen that one maybe. This one grows at the base of trees because it's decomposing the bark of trees. This one. I saw that one yesterday walking my dog. Uh, these, in general, they're called minky caps because that's a special feature of this group. As the spore matures, an enzyme is released in the tissue that dissolve, that makes the tissue dissolve. And so it turns into an inky black mess. The spores are black. You can write with it. It's like it's like ink. So it doesn't last long. So it's easy to grow. We I used to grow them. So we the, my students used to grow them. But but they don't last but like a day. Maybe two at the most. So uh, they're good to eat but commercially you know you could never get it to a market. This one's interesting. Inky cap. This inky cap. Um, especially where you've taken out a tree and there's wood underground, it'll grow the next year. But this one's interesting because it's edible, but you can't eat it with, with alcohol. You can't drink alcohol, you'll get sick. It has the same compounds found in ant abuse. It's an alcoholic take, you know, so you, you don't feel good if you, know, if you drink alcohol. You shouldn't drink alcohol even the next day after you eat that mushroom. Yeah, so that's interesting. There are all kinds of fun things about mushrooms. These are mushrooms that are common in wood chips. This is a cup one, right? Obviously a cup one. Big, it's called the Ziza, big brown cup. 
and the other ones look nondescript. I guess they sort of are. This one's one of the most common mushrooms in Davis. I know we're in Placerville, but that one's extremely common. It's kind of nondescript. And are those edible, the wood chip mushrooms? Oh, not necessarily. Uh, yeah, you know, this one, with, this is edible. This is probably edible, but the, it's, it's, the texture is really thin. There's not much to it, so you probably wouldn't eat it. But just because it, there are some uh, deadly ones that grow on wood, so you, yeah, you wouldn't want to. So and, the yeah. uh, bark beetle that's ravaging the forest, yeah. does it follow that mushrooms follow the bark beetle? Well, because when the tree dies, certainly, yeah. But when there's a re whether there's a relationship, I don't know. There is a relationship between one fungus that you've You've seen it on the sides of a tree. It just looks like a ball attached to the wood. Yeah. And now the spores are inside. It's, there's no way for the spores to get out. It depends on a bark beetle to drill a hole. The bark beetle gets covered with the spores and then it carries on. Yeah. That's kind of an interesting one, too. Yeah. And then these, if you haven't seen these, this fall, after it rains, look carefully at twigs on the ground, dead twigs on the ground. These are very small. So this cup is about the size of a raindrop. And the raindrop, it did have a lid which uh, matured and blew off. Um, the raindrop hits this cup and it splashes out these perioles or eggs. See the eggs here? And these eggs splash out. And in this case, there is a, each pretty old egg case thing surrounded by glue. It gets splashed out and it sticks onto another twig, ready to go for the next year. This one is even more amazing. At the tip of that egg is a little thread. It's all coiled up. When the raindrop splashes that egg out, the, the little filament extends and it wraps it around the twig. <laughs> and so it's on a twig, ready for next year. What is in your head? These, yeah. Um, I just include these, because you may see these. If they're around. They're in this area. I, I took this one at the Marshall Gold. Yeah, Discovery Park there. Yeah, it's common. Um, this one, these are found in, not necessarily limited to cities, but they are often very common in parks and cities. This is very common in, in Davis, for example. Now this one, I, I know it's, the picture's not that good. You can't tell why that, the, you can't tell the color of the spores by the color of the gills, but this one has reddish spores. <laughs> It also, um, you can't probably see it, it has a cup. But the combination of red spores and a cup, that's good to eat. But just forget I said that. <laughs> <laughs> this one's called the bluet, and it it's kind of blue or purplish, yeah. like that. That's good to eat. This one occurs in huge numbers. Uh, it's so thin and small, you wouldn't eat that one. And this one's interesting because is almost always limited to flower pots. Uh -huh. Has anybody seen a yellow mushroom in a flower pot? No. No. Okay. Well, if you water a little bit more, you might. <laughs> yeah, you see it in flower pots. Or in like hanging baskets and that kind of thing, you know? Okay. That's kind of interesting. Um, just uh, more common ones. Uh, this this one's called Sunny Side Up because it looks like an egg. It doesn't last more than a day. It's real fragile. And that's the definition of a mushroom. That it's uh, putrescent. They rot very quickly. So what about these uh, hallucinogens? Okay, I'll get to those. Okay. I think. I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure the group. I didn't know I was going to get that question. So I don't, I don't remember if I included those. Oh, we're in the marijuana. Yeah. Now. Okay. <laughs> all right. I'll tell you all about it. So, um, puffballs. 
They don't have gills. The spores are born internally. This is a really interesting one. The only place I've ever found this one is in the real high Sierra. And these puffballs, they're fairly common. And then the earth stars have this, this fold of tissue that breaks apart and it looks like a star or something. These are called earth stars. Stink horns. They're interesting. Totally different way of dispersing spores. So the spores are in this green slimy layer up here. This cap, right? It smells like rotting meat. And so flies come and land on it. And so many flies are attracted to it, the flies pick up all the spores and take the spores away and distribute the spores. So this one had a, a green slime layer of spores, but the, all, the flies have taken away all the spores. This one, it's, it's around, and I don't know if you've been lucky enough to see it, but well, I get phone calls about that one because people just don't know what that is in their backyards. But it's, a, it's called an ornate stink horn. And that green slimy, slimy layer is on the inside of these, of the, of the lattice network there. Yeah, so the flies don't get the spores. Pretty interesting. Some fungi on wood, turkey tail, some of you know, because it has these bands. Very common on oak, oak uh, down oaks or dead oak twigs, branches, and so forth. It's abundant. Chicken of the woods is a real treat to find in the forest. If you're in the dark forest, you're, I don't know, November, December, it's cloudy, the sun is low, it's dark, and then this bright thing in front of you on the tree. Chicken of the woods. Chicken of the woods. Yeah, it's edible. Yeah. I don't know what else to say about that one. It's pretty. This one is called the jack o' lantern one. It glows in the dark. I've seen it, and even the wood will glow. Why does the wood glow? Because the wood is full of the mycelium, right? So you have to you have to take it. You have to sit in a very dark room, absolutely dark. You have to sit, let your eyes get really adjusted to it, and you you can see the blue, the blue glow. Yeah, I, people. A number of mushrooms do that. Not a lot, but a number. We don't know why. Maybe it attracts some insects. We don't know why. Uh, so the wood glows. It's been suggested that when Moses, now we're, we're talking about Moses now, <laughs> that Moses, he was walking through the desert of Sinai. He saw on the top of Mount Sinai a bush that was burning, but it wasn't consumed. Mm -hmm. See, it could have been a, a mushroom. <laughs> So he went up there, and the bush started talking, and that's when I stopped. <laughs> this one, this this one is not good to eat. The oyster mushrooms. Somebody, oh yes, yes. Question. Um, so most of the plants and animals that produce light, they do something where they get the sunlight and save the energy up and leave. Yeah. What, no. what do these do? Yeah, this is bioluminescence. This is the uh, a byproduct of some reaction is light. Is the photon of light. Not not that kind. Not yeah. Not not excitation. Yeah. It, it, bioluminescence. Yeah. Oyster mushroom, some of you are familiar with this mushroom. It's a, it's, it, It'll grow like 21 days after the first good soaking rain, so get out there and look for it. It often will grow in the same spot year after year. So it's rotting this tree trunk. It's more common on hardwoods than it is conifers, like this one I found up here in the Sierra. But um, it's fruiting, it's good to eat, you won't mistake it for anything. And then next year it'll be fruiting from this, this trunk again until it exhausts all the nutrients in that tree. You can, of course, you can buy the, the oyster mushroom in the store. And in that case, it's, it's grown on wood, but it's grown on sawdust in bags. That's how it's, it's easy to grow. It's like the weed. If you're, if you're a mushroom cultivation, it's like the weed of the mushrooms. It, it's very easy and very fast growing. Oh, here's the death cow. You're interested in the death cow. 
So the death cap is a is a beautiful color. It's a large mushroom. It just has to be edible. But it's not. You can't see, it has white spores, it has free gills, you can't see the ring, it's under the cap. But you can see the cup very well, right? So that's the death cap. That's responsible for 90% of mushroom fatalities. The toxin is, you know, very bad. It, it, what it does is stop your DNA from replicating. So you know you're replacing your cells all the time, right? You're not, you're not the, the self you were a long time ago. Your cells are being turned over. And so the DNA has to replicate, and it stops that. It, it stops DNA. That's why I don't know how any um, insect or slug can eat this one, but I, I've seen it myself, and I don't know how they do that. But most things will leave it alone. I hope deer will leave it alone. This mushroom, Amanita phylloides it's called, is, grows on the roots on oak trees. It's symbiotic. It's beneficial. It helps oak trees grow. It was brought into the United States on cork oak plants from Portugal, right? So they brought in, they didn't bring in the acorns and plant the, or the cork oak. They brought in small trees to Sonoma County because the wine industry wanted cork. So they brought that tree and they brought this one with it. It's still spreading in California. It's very common, uh, you know, Napa, Sonoma, the coastal area. It's not just Sonoma, but the coastal area. It, it's here too. And if you want to see it, go to Point Reyes around Thanksgiving. It's, it can be abundant. Okay, I think, did anybody else have any questions on the death cap? If, it's, if, it, if it does grow in the full sun, it could be washed out, and it could be whitish. So you have got to be careful of that. Does it grow in our native home? Yes. Yes, yeah, so it, it spread, it produces spores, and then it spread on our, our uh, live oaks. Yeah. And here's another one in the Sierra. It's called the panther. It, it also has a cup, and it's related to the death cap. It will make you sick, so you'll stay away from that one. And then this one is fairly common around here, because I, I, I have taken pictures here. This is the destroying angel. As, as deadly as the death cap, but it doesn't fruit in big numbers. It likes to fruit one at a time, and only in the spring. The death cap is fall and winter. This one is only in the spring and only under oaks. So you might look for it. It's kind of stately. It's all white, and it has a cup in the spring. Uh, then a bunch of wood waters, uh, Growing on wood, you've probably you've seen these before, or different ones. This one's called the artist's conch because if you scratch the undersurface, it, it bruises brown, so you can draw a picture of it. More more on wood. This is lion's mane. Some of you may have eaten lion's mane. It grows around here. It's not common, but it, it's here for sure. It, it has these soft spines, or like icicles, and the spores are born on the spines. This is called, and so this one's easy to grow too. A bag, a plastic bag of sawdust is how we grow it. Yes? You call it lion's mane? Or monkey's head, or pom pom, or bear's paw, whatever you want. So, so I have a friend who ordered that for her husband who yes. has memory deficit. Yeah, yeah. So this is what this is. If you're eating mushrooms for medicinal purposes and you want to pick a mushroom that helps regenerate nerve endings, this is the one. Okay. Okay. But since we're talking about that, medicinal uses of mushrooms, and so that's the claim. There's a paper. It's in that document that I sent you. You can look it up if you want to read more about it. But we need more clinical trials. We need more replicable. More trials that are well replicated, non biased, and blind on humans to say a, a lot about the medicinal benefits. And people argue, well, the Chinese have been using mushrooms medicinally for 2,000 years because there's a book, it's called uh, the Herbal Remedies or something, Natural, 
natural fertile varieties. Anyway, it's in my document and it's like 2,000 years old. And people argue, well, mushrooms are mentioned there, so people have been using them for a long time. And that's anecdotal evidence that, it, that they really do something. But the truth is, mushrooms are hardly me mentioned in that book at all. It's one of those things, if you keep repeating something, people eventually <coughs> believe it. And it just gets passed on. So we need more trials. There are, there are ongoing trials with the magic mushrooms, the hallucinogenic, the philosophy mushrooms for um, post-traumatic stress disorder and for depression. There are clinical trials going on right now, uh, so that's good. Um, there are trials with shiitake because it, it reduces the growth of tumors in culture and in mice, but you know we need more data for, for humans, so they, that they're, they're more favorably adopted by Western medicine. Yeah, that makes sense? And you can get diet supplements of all the, of, not all, of many mushrooms. And on the label, it'll claim to do this and that. But you know, dietary supplements aren't regulated well by the Food and Drug Administration in this country. They can be almost anything. And, and you read the, the small print, the disclaimer, you know, this hasn't been tested on anything. So, you know, that's the kind of where we are with mushrooms. Yeah. So, all kinds of promise, but we need more. I'm not going to hurt you. I mean, mushrooms are good for you. They're a good source of fiber. They're a good source of vitamins. You know, they have a lot of uh, protein for a vegetable. Beans and Brussels sprouts have more protein and then mushrooms. So, low in calories. There's a lot of good things about mushrooms. Have they been found in archaeological digs? Yeah, uh, yes, they have like, mushroom statues and that kind of thing. The, the Mayans apparently used mushrooms, the hallucinogenic mushrooms for ceremonies. Well, we know that Aztecs did too. We, and, and not just Mayans and Aztecs, but yeah, other groups. Uh, we know they did. Yeah, other groups did, yeah. It, but you know, it was often the healer who took the mushroom. It wasn't you, the sick person. <laughs> It was the healer who could see inside you. Oh, yeah. I'm glad you clarified that. Okay. So um, now here's a mushroom that's growing on wood that's deadly poisonous. See, so you can't uh, pick a mushroom on wood. Maybe some, a few of you eat enoki, the mushroom enoki. You can buy it some in grocery stores. This is the wild enoki. When we cultivate it, we grow it on wood chips. We grow it in the dark. And mushrooms need light for proper development. Everybody thinks mushrooms grow in the dark. Yes. Only the bug mushroom grows in the dark. All other mushrooms need light for proper development. The reason they grow mushrooms in the dark on a button farm, it would be a waste of money to turn on the lights. That's all. It won't hurt them. But that one grows in the dark. If you grow enoki, like a lot of mushrooms, in the dark, it'll have tiny white caps with a long, thin stalk. And that's why you can buy at the store and you use them for soups and salads. That's you know, That's my neighbor's front yard on a stump. <laughs> okay, morels. So a lot of you are familiar with morels. So you can think of morels as a series of cups, right, connected to a stalk. So these are, this is the one that grows in landscape wood chips like around your local bank here pretty soon. This one grows is called the black morel it grows up in the in the forest here. This one is called the false morel. But I see I don't think you're gonna mistake this one for this. I don't think you are. It's called the false morel. This one's not good to eat. This one's interesting because it has a compound in it that's related to a rocket fuel. It's a hydrazine. This is a highly volatile fuel. So if you light it, poof. So if, if, you, if you cut this one up and put it in a pan, the hydrogen will just leak, right? It'll evaporate really quick. Then you can eat it. But you know, you want to be safe, so just stay away from that. But if you do that, you can't have your head over the pan. <laughs> it's not good. Now that same compound is found in the common button mushroom. In that case, it's called a garotene. 
in real small amounts. This is why we should cook mushrooms. Because even the, even the button mushroom has a small amount of this rocket fuel type chemical. If you cook the button mushroom, it just leaves, right? It leaves quickly. That's just a small amount. And you're, you're not going to eat enough button mushrooms anyway to worry about. But mushrooms should be cooked. I'll just leave it at that. And bolis, um, bolis are different because they don't have gills, they have pores under, underneath. It's like a spongy, uh, a sponge of pores, really. And some of you are familiar with the king boli, the porcini. This is porcini. And it's up in this here. We have it in Sierra. Yes? In the previous slide, you had what looked like gray stone laying right on the ground. Oh, oh, one before oh, this. Yeah. Oh, this one. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot that one. So this one here, called carbon balls. You find it on dead oak. Look, if you find an oak that's fallen over, a big branch that's fallen down, look for that one. It's really tough. It's really, it's like, you'll think it's like carbon. You know, you only think that's a mushroom, but yeah, look, look for it under oaks. It's common. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so, Bolis go around. Yeah, there are people who just love to collect bolis, uh, porcini, and only porcini. It's a big deal. Where, where, does, and, it and, where does it grow? Under pines up, up in the Sierra. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we so there were a lot under <coughs> after that Hurricane Hillary that I mentioned. It was quite high. You know, you know Silver Lake up there? Yeah, that was a good one. Um, so, and, and so these, okay, this is called Matsutake, it's, uh, a lot of people like it, I don't quite get it, but it's very expensive, I mean a mushroom, some, there are collectors here in California that send those mushrooms to Japan, and people will pay a hundred dollars for a good Matsutake, yeah, I mean, second only to truffles as far as the value. Now this is a chanterelle again. Um, this is called cochra. It's it's a, it's related to um, you know the death cap, but it's an edible. So you really have to know what you're doing if you're collecting that one. But all of these are mycorrhizal. They're beneficial, right? They're growing in and around the roots of trees. So if you go to the grocery store and and find porcini or chanterelles, somebody's collected them in the wild, whether they're fresh or they're dried, and nobody knows how to cultivate. So if you learn how to cultivate them, you'd be a multi-millionaire, close to a billionaire, overnight. Nobody knows how to grow them. Why? Yep, they get something from the tree. I don't know. Maybe they. Maybe it's just that interface with the root they get that is required. Yes. Isn't that the case with the morales also? No, no. Well, oh, that's a good question. How about the morales? Well, the morales might grow as well. Yeah. Some people think they definitely are, but there are some morels that are definitely not. You can grow a certain species of morel. The one that you find in the wood chips around your, your local bank or whatever, your CVS. You look for that one this fall. That one's not mycorrhizal. That one's just breaking down the wood chips. You can grow it with great difficulty. It's, it's difficult. So there's specific trees that Chantel grows on? Oh, well, oaks for here. No. Ah, yeah, people can't plant an oak forest and inoculate the trees? Yeah, so yes, you, you can do that. People do that for truffles because truffles are, truffles are more valuable. The problem is all these other fungi, mushrooms out there, they're also going to colonize your forest and you're just going to get some. Or in the, in the case of the good black truffle, you pay somebody a lot of money to raise little trees in the greenhouse and that are inoculated with the black trouble from France, you know, the really good one? Right. And then you plant those out in, in your property, and five or seven or ten years later, you go back and you collect them. Except there aren't very many because the native troubles, which aren't very good, have come in and displaced them. So if you're going to spend your money that way, be careful. Make sure you have a lot of money to play with. Because you still hear people doing that. Ah, here, hallucinogenic ones. Okay, this is what you wanted. So this is the one 
that I took, this picture from that golf course in the Olympic Peninsula. So go up there in November, just wander around, find a golf course that no one's golfing at, just walk out there and collect all you want. Uh, this is the, the quintessential magic mushroom, Psilocybe cubensis. This is the one that you know people get in trouble with. And so it's, 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 not, it's pretty easy to grow, but if you want to find it, not that you would, not that I'm encouraging you to, but Point Reyes, just south of the visitor center. <laughs> there, well, there's a horse. Well, there's a horse stable behind the visitor center. But but, it, but there's another one. Uh, I forget what it's called. Uh, you know, five miles to the is it south or west? And then they have trails. It's part of the park. They have trails, so that the horses use that trail, and that's a good if you. You wanted to take photos of that. Photo. <laughs> <laughs> that brings up a question because I'm going back to the 1950s, hunting mushrooms every year with my dad, and he said outside of Marysville, he always looked for fields where there were cattle. Yeah. So he's he's looking for a relative of the common button mushroom. Yeah. Yeah, that grows in that situation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, an agaricus species. And the fly here we talked about, it's hallucinogenic, it'll make you sick. Um, this is called Laughing Jim, it's called. This Jim Monopolis is called Laughing Jim. But it, it, in California, it's not very biologically active. Back east, apparently, it's more active. Okay, but I'm going to leave these, unless you have any questions on hallucinogenic mushrooms. Everyone's okay with that. All right. Uh, this is just because they're pretty. Yeah. These are coral mushrooms. Yeah. Very pretty. And then truffles are a type of mushroom that grows underground. It's just typical mushroom, but it relies on animals like squirrels to dig them up, eat the, eat the truffle, and then the spores survive the trip through the animal, and the animal disperses the spores. You've gone into the forest, and you've seen little divots all over the place. You know, you wonder what those little divots were. Those are squirrels looking for truffles. Another one, so, and the squirrels may have missed one, if you want to try it. California has so many truffles. Most of them are good for squirrels, but not good for us so much. It won't hurt you, but they're not. They, sometimes they smell really bad. But the squirrels like them. Also, in the forest, if you want to find a truffle, walk in the forest, and if you see flies hovering close to the ground, maybe you've seen flies hovering close to the ground, because they may be over a truffle. Because that's where they lay their eggs, right? Okay, so this is the, the black France truffle that's worth so much. This is the Italian white. They grow under oaks. Um, they used to use pigs, maybe somebody still does, to smell the truffle and then jerk back on the pig and then find the truffle. But they have trained dogs now that will find the truffles. Right? Okay. And this is my last slide. Because maybe you've seen slime molds before. And this one is common in the spring in your area, in the forest. It, while it's still moist, it's, these are not molds. And they're not fungi at all. They're they're in the amoeba group. You know, amoeba is this one one cell, tiny thing that glides over the ground, engulfing bacteria. Same with that. Relative with that, not not a mold at all. They uh, eventually this eventually this this one's called dog vomit. <laughs> eventually, it dries up, and it's this color, and inside are the spores. Um, here's another pretty one. Yeah, I, they're, just, they're, they're from here. I, mean, I took this one not far from here. Anyway, those are the the slime holes. Questions? Yes. Yes. I would like to know two questions. The one is a fresh mushroom grown out in the wild versus a farm. Is there a difference? Is there a difference between a wild grown mushroom and a cultivated mushroom? Uh, so definitely, certain species have different.
tastes. So as far as that goes, there's definitely a difference. If you took the cultivated mushroom, I mean, we're to find that outside, it would probably taste the same. You won't find that outside. So the ones in the wild have a different flavor. Yeah, that's fair to say. Any other questions? Yeah, one more. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> that is truffle oil. Is yeah. It, is it what they say? What well, we hope, I mean, if, so you can put truffles in oil and they'll get some of the, oh, the uh, taste of truffle. You know, which I think is really good. I, I think the taste of the truffle is really good if you haven't tried it. Um, you can put a truffle in with some eggs and then and you'll get the odor or taste of truffles. Or some people put truffles in with rice. We do it that way. So, yeah, I think so. Yes? What's the best way to keep mushrooms fresh in the refrigerator? Yeah, so don't wash them or anything. Just put them in there. Put them in a, a paper bag that, with holes that breathe. Paper bag with holes. So it needs to be humid, but if you don't want it to sweat. Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? And then if you want to wash them in water, do it, but only immediately before you cook them. Yeah. Yes. Years ago, I had the good fortune of being introduced to the candy cat mushroom. Yeah. Where does that typically grow? Oh, it's common in the coastal mountains. I'm sure it's here too, but if you point rays, uh, okay. salt point, I mean, they, they're common. And you know, you can, the candy cat has a real sweet odor, like maple. It, oh, I had a baked in pie, yeah, yeah. and it was just like, it was like maple syrup. Yeah, it right. It was fabulous. Yeah, and they're common, and, and so most people don't pick them. Most people don't know what they are, so. They're, they're out there for you. you know? yeah. Yes? My understanding of the snow plant and the pine grass oh, yeah. and the chlorophyllous plants are actually a parasite on the fungi? Yeah. So every, people are familiar with pine drop and snow plant, that red plant that grows in the spring. And it doesn't have chlorophyll. So for the longest time, everybody thought it was a parasite on the roots of the pine tree. That makes sense. But it's actually growing on the fungus, which is growing on the pine tree. Yeah. That's a good relationship. Yeah, yeah, good point. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Yes. Whoa, wait, no, I, I don't think the, the fungus benefits at all. Because we're parasite the fungus. Yeah, no, no, it's it's, it's not a symbiotic. That mean that would mean both both benefit. Yeah. But the fungus doesn't benefit from it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's a parasite, yes. <clears throat> Earlier today, I found a growth on, in the forest. Um, it was like a like that black corn, you know, just round and uh -huh. right on there. Uh -huh. And I tried to kick it, and it really held on. Uh -huh. So I had to break it, uh -huh. and it was most of it was underground. Uh -huh. and it was uh, had a structure that was tough. It, it could have been a fungus if you got. Uh, uh, I, I don't have a common name for it, but if you looked up. You can remember this Faolus PH, Faolus Schwinnetzia. I think it's that. Right. I don't have a comedy. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have a comedy. But then, and again, so it doesn't sound like uh, maybe it was last year's, maybe a lot of it broke off, but it does expand. But it stays low to the ground and it's tough and it's hard and it's easier to trip over. Yeah, we've all done it. Yes. Is there um, an etiquette around you yeah. come across a, a colony in the forest? Yeah. You immediately pick it, kick it, yeah. stomp it? Yeah, you definitely don't kick or stomp. But if you're going to collect it from the table, I just, just cut it off. Because then you're not disturbing the mycelium, and another one might go right in its place. So, okay. yeah. And of course, when you pick a mushroom, yeah, most of it's underground, and you're not hurting it. Right? Yeah. Yes? A few of these are tree pathogens in the forest. A few of them are. Uh, okay, well, the ones that are growing on the side of the wood, they are growing. The, so the, the, you have a tree. The inner part of the tree is not alive. And those are rotting the inner tree. So it's not killing the tree, but it's not doing it any good either. Is that so? Pathogen means, uh, well, you could define it that way. 
Anyway, they are only rotting the inner wood, not the living candy. So they are uh, the bane of the forest industry because they cut down a tree. Oh no, it's hollow inside. You know, sometimes you can't tell. But we, don't we find some in the living tissue of the, of the conifers, like heterobacidia and anosa? Heterobacidia is a good pathogen. Yes, I didn't mention that one. Yes, that's a tree killer. But generally, those are the small minority. Yeah, I guess that's the, that's the point. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a small minority, but it's pretty widespread. Yeah, yeah, it is. You see pockets of dead trees. Yosemite is a good place to see heterobacidia. If you see pine trees in, the, in this little area, there's 10 dead small pine trees. Yeah. Good point. Okay, thank you very much.